of course, no talk about stroke is, uh, is complete without telling you about the epidemiology, and this is the epidemiology in the UK of vascular disease. So uh, that's a quarter of a million uh, uh, MIs, uh, about 145,000 strokes, and this many TIAs and peripheral artery diseases here. But you know, whenever I put this slide up and talk about 100,000 here, 50,000 there, it doesn't really mean anything to any of us, does it? Because these, these numbers are so large that uh, uh, it's difficult to equate it in terms of a patient that's sitting opposite, uh, uh, opposite your uh, consulting room. So I guess another way of putting it to you in terms of stroke, it is the equivalent, in terms of incidence, it is the equivalent of a fully laden Boeing 747 crushing, killing everybody on board every single week. That is the uh, instance of stroke in the United Kingdom. Okay. So it is a, a big problem. Uh, and, and obviously if uh, Boeing's M4 servers were crashing every week, there'd be a, a public outcry be on the front page of every newspaper across the world. But that's essentially what's happening every single week in terms of stroke. The UK consumes actually 7% uh, of the entire NHS budget in terms of stroke. So the commonest modifiable risk factors are, uh, these, the list goes on, I've uh, only just picked up five or six common ones that you'll all know about. Um, but without doubt, the, the, the commonest modifiable risk factor is uh, high blood pressure. And this uh, is a composite slide of pretty much all the trials that have been published in the instance of blood pressure against the instance of, uh, of stroke. <coughs> and this is the relative risk of stroke in deep diastolic blood pressure, but the graph picture would still be the same if it was diastolic or systolic. And as you can see, there's pretty much a log linear increase with increasing uh, or incidence of stroke with increase in blood pressure. The take-home message from this particular slide, of course, is this bit here. Even at what you and I would regard as normal blood pressure, pressure that you've probably got whilst you're sitting there in the audience, you have an increased risk of uh, a linear increased risk of stroke, uh, even with normal blood pressure. So my view has always been there's no such thing as low blood pressure. The definition of low blood pressure is when a patient stands up and gets dizzy. Otherwise, keep the blood pressure as low as possible. In fact, if you were to uh, reduce population in the UK blood pressure by uh, a mere five or six millimetres of mercury, not very much to be honest, five or six millimetres of mercury, you would slash the incidence of stroke in this country by 40%, four zero, by a population reduction of five millimetres of mercury. And to achieve that five millimetres of mercury, by the way, you don't need uh, expensive drug companies, expensive drugs to be prescribed to you. I told you this talk is non-promotional. All you need to do is reduce the, uh, the amount of salt in two items of food. And those two items, if you reduce the amount of salt by 10% in bread and cornflakes, that will reduce the population incidence of blood pressure by five or six millimeters of mercury, and you'd slash the incidence of stroke by 40%. Uh, because pretty much everybody at some point eats bread and cornflakes, so that's really all you need to do. And it's just to remind you that it was on the background of that kind of instance that I've already uh, mentioned to you that the government launched, uh, the previous government in fact, launched the National Stroke Strategy. And uh, uh, these are just some of the things that they uh, introduced in that National Stroke Strategy. And about the same time, they launched the FAST campaign, which you're all familiar with, based on speech and then time to call 999. And that resulted in the London Ambulance receiving more than 50% uh, 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 increase in number of calls. And the stroke strategy suggested that all these acute stroke patients should be taken to a hyperacute stroke unit. And after a lot of uh, consultation, wrangling, wrangling, arguments and so on, essentially we've boiled down in the last uh, just over a year now uh, to hyperacute stroke units in London. So stroke was managed, of course, like everywhere else in the UK, across the whole of London. Uh, but it was decided to centralise it to just eight sites. And these are the eight sites. Uh, I'm at the Imperial site here. Um, uh, and uh, uh, pretty much London Ambulance will bypass all other hospitals to take uh, patients to these uh, eight sites, uh, although the other hospitals still have stroke units, but these are sort of uh, secondary care, uh, 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 sort of rehabilitation units where HASUs can discharge to, to look after. So our turnaround in a HASU, uh, in a hyperacute unit, is probably about uh, three days. So what's happening in the drug world? Well, um, uh, I'm just going to uh, tell you about one thing that's happening in the, uh, uh, in the anti-platelet world. Um, uh, <coughs> you'll know that aspirin, of course, is the mainstay of treatment in, uh, uh, in stroke. 
Uh, and aspirin works. It works pretty much across the board in terms of uh, vascular disease. It works in MI, stroke, peripheral artery disease. And you get a risk reduction of, in secondary prevention of about 25%, pretty much. And uh, we've known that for many years, and it works very well. And you have at your disposal three principal antiplatelet uh, uh, drugs. You have uh, uh, aspirin, uh, which works as a uh, thromboxin uh, A2 inhibitor on the platelet. You have diprinamol, which is a phosphodiesterase uh, uh, inhibitor. And you have clopidogrel, uh, which works uh, uh, the ADP receptor. And of course, clopidogrel plavix uh, uh, has just uh, come off patent, so the price has plummeted, and uh, the guidelines are changing everywhere to to let people know that uh, uh, clopidogrel is probably a better bet than, uh, uh, than aspirin. So, uh, just finishing off, <coughs> this is my uh, number of needed to treat slide. Uh, so this uh, puts all the interventions that are in your arm to treat stroke, and it allows you to compare them on the same platform. The question being asked is, how many people do I need to treat to benefit one individual, the number needed to treat? So if you have a stroke unit, you need to treat 18 people on that stroke unit to benefit one individual. It does cost you something, of course, but you know, on the whole, you've got your physios there, you've got your beds there, you can take a corner of the ward and call it a stroke unit. It's not going to cost you a huge amount of money. Aspirin, uh, you need to treat about 80 people. It will cost you about $60. It will cost you about 60 bucks. If you choose the cheapest anti-blood pressure medication, you need to treat about 17 people. It will cost you about 200 bucks a year. Uh, <coughs> Clopidogrel has changed now slightly because uh, it's got cheaper, but about 60 people, it will cost you $57,000. I need to thrombolize 16 people before I benefit one individual. It's going to cost my institution 28000 bucks, And my surgeons need to operate on 26 carotids before they benefit one individual. It's going to cost the hospital $140,000 to benefit that one individual. Take no message from this slide is, which is the least effective uh, intervention in your armory, I, which is the one that you need to treat the more, most number of patients before you benefit one individual? Aspirin. The least effective out of the whole lot. And the reason you use it is not because it's uh, effective, because of that. It's cheap. It's cheap. That's why you're using it. But remember, it's the least effective in your armory.